Next up on our Olympic coverage on IUHoosiers.com and our Olympic website is a physiologist from the Councilman Center for the Science of Swimming, Professor Joel Steger. First of all, thanks so much for joining us. And I've got to ask, what is this pool? What does it do? Well, we call this the, the flume room, and this is the swimming flume. And the idea here is that we can put an athlete in here and we can regulate how much work they're doing by regulating how fast they have to swim to keep up in, in, in that particular position. So needless to say, when you have the athlete in here and we're gonna have them wired up and they're gonna be breathing in the hoses so we can measure respiratory function and cardiac function and basically their ability to sustain the certain metabolic rates within certain, uh, let's say, environmental temperatures such as pool temperature or air temperature up above the pool. So. You've also been documenting, studying uh, swim times in Olympic games of the past to create a power curve to be able to predict outcomes. Uh, why don't you speak to, a little bit to that research? Yeah, this, this particular project that you're talking about really started around 2000. Uh, in 2000, the swimsuit manufacturer started introducing suits and uh, they were suggesting technology such as like uh, shark skin type fabrics and dermal denticles and all these things. But the claims that they were making were way outside of what we would consider reality. Um, the manufacturers at the time weren't willing to give us any suits to test. And so literally, I think this is one of my first Eureka moments. Uh, I realized that Prior to 2000, none of these suits existed. But after 2000, everybody was wearing them. So the athletes were, in fact, running the experiment for us. So what we did is we got a hold of all the times uh, performed prior to the introduction of these new suits, and we started asking the questions of whether or not the times had improved. Well, the answer was in 2000, um, I think there were roughly let's say 1,500 swims with the new suits, they were no different. They were no faster than before the new suits were introduced. So that started us thinking about how we would, we would uh, or if we could predict the outcomes of, uh, let's say, the Olympic trials or the Olympic Games by looking at what happened historically. Um, as time goes by, it gets harder and harder and harder to go faster and faster and faster. And that doesn't, you know, we're not necessarily talking just about swimming. Uh, we could be talking about track and field to the point where as you get, get down the road a ways, you don't, you don't expect to see a lot of world records. So we did the analysis again in 2004 and basically came up with the same conclusions that the suits, the new technology uh, didn't have an effect. Now, the other side of the coin was uh, in, in, let's say, 1996, a swimsuit probably cost somewhere between 30 and 50 bucks. Uh, by 2004, swim, swimsuits were now four or five hundred dollars, and by 2008 or 2009, there were six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars. So, as, as time goes by, our modeling became better and better, and so we're, we're more able to predict the outcomes of these races. Um, we were consistent in saying that the manufacturer's claims were not valid uh, until 2007, and then everything changed. And our ability to predict the outcome, meaning the, the average times, basically we weren't able to. Um, everybody was swimming way faster than they should have, given the progression over time. So that brings us to 2008. We ran all of these projections again, and uh, the outcomes were horrible, meaning I'm not sure, maybe, maybe we were successful 16% of the time, whereas in the past we've been successful 90% of the time. So the conclusion was after 2008, yes, the suits had an effect, and they were, it was a very large effect. Um, an example is going into the 2008 games, um, um, well, let's put it this way. After the 2008 games, let's look at one event, 100 freestyle, 24 of the fastest times ever of the top 25 times was swam at the 2008 games. That, that's how big this, this effect was. So the long and short of it is by 2009, it became very clear that um, 
everybody started asking, what, what's the point of all of this? Um, it was difficult for colleges, for example, where uh, you know the, the, the swimsuit budget might have been fifteen or twenty thousand uh, dollars for a team to put a team in the water for a year, you know, in, in two thousand. Um, that budget went up to seventy or eighty thousand uh, in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. So teams were having difficulty. So there are, there are financial ramifications as well as interesting questions pertaining to that. So where are we now? 2012, the suits are no longer legal. Uh, so the question is, will our projections go back to being accurate? Um, and in order to test that, we have to throw out the results from 2008 to see whether or not they're back on the line. And that's where we are today. In 2008, you actually traveled to Beijing to ask different questions than what you were asking before. You were studying if there was a certain brand of swimsuit that was further along technologically than others, and you made an interesting discovery when you talked to some of the swimmers. Yeah, it was after the second day of competition, one of the swimmers that we knew that was participating in the games came up into the stands and said, hey, we've got a problem, because they knew I was writing down what suit everybody had on. It's like, what's the problem? It's like, the swimmers are wearing two or three suits. And what they're doing is they're wearing the suit that they are signed with. So if they're signed with Speedo, for example, that suit is going on the outside, but they're wearing two or three suits underneath it. Well, <laughs> and the reason for this is that if, essentially if one suit worked, you know, two or three suits worked better, but it had nothing to do with the surface characteristics. It, had, it seemed to be, it had a lot to do with the buoyancy factor that these suits were creating. Looking at the 2012 games, you mentioned that the suits have been outlawed. Was it, if you had to guess, it was 2008 a situation where some of the swimmers were using wood rackets while others were using graphite? Or will all of them wearing the same suit be an equalizing factor and still the best swimmers of 2008 who are coming back in 12 will be able to uh, kind of repeat their performances? Well, again, there are two comments to be made about that. One of the disappointing facts about the Olympic Games is that, you know, we all aren't created equal. So, for example, uh, one event I was watching had, um, I think there were around 20 heats, and there are about eight swimmers per heat, but we didn't see a new suit until about the last six or so heats. Uh, these were not purchased by the swimmers, obviously. The manufacturers were providing these to the swimmers, but you had to be somebody to get them. So to some extent, the manufacturers are deciding the outcomes, right? In other words, if you're not a somebody, you're not gonna get one of these suits. So we've got that. Well, then you go, well, from the sixth heat on up to the, 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 the last heat, um, yeah, if everybody has a suit, then what's the point, right? The, the playing field is level again. Uh, so uh, I think, I think the, the competitors started recognizing that their efforts in terms of training and commitment and discipline became secondary to, hey, what suit are you wearing? So when the, when the athletes started compl complaining about this, um, it, it made the whole uh, community start questioning whether this was necessary. We're a couple of weeks out now from the swimming events of the Olympic Games, and I know a lot of sports fans out there will open up the Sports Illustrated and go event by event to see who the favorites are or check out ESPN, the magazine, but you're kind of our own personal Sports Illustrated, ESPN, the magazine. A lot of people talking about this Lochte Phelps rivalry. Phelps, in consideration to be the greatest swimmer of all time. Lochte's had him in his sights. <laughs> who do you see getting the better of the deal in, uh, in London in 12? I mean, you know what? I'm like everybody else. I can't wait to watch. Um, I think Michael clearly is an outstanding athlete right, one of a kind. Uh, but there's something about being chased versus being the chaser. And I think uh, Lotke um, is highly motivated to be the guy. And uh, Michael's been there, done that. So I think, um, I think if, you're, if you wanna see world records set, those are probably the events to watch because uh, some of the events it's kind of a, well, how hard do I have to swim to win? Uh, but when Ryan and, uh, and Michael are head to head, it's gonna be, you better set the record. You better be going for the record because there's no tomorrow. <laughs>
looking on the women's side, are there uh, some Americans specifically that maybe sports fans should be looking out for? And will Stephanie Rice be kind of the name of the games? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, from the United States perspective, we've kind of had a turnover. You know, the, the, the stars from the last couple Olympic games uh, aren't in the field, as we all know. We've had some superstars like Dara Torres. Hey, fourth place doesn't get you a ticket. Um, um, so, so we have a new group of swimmers. Um, the bad news about that is they don't have the same kind of experience, and so there's some unknown there in terms of how they're going to perform under the spotlight of the Olympic Games. Uh, but we've got some really talented young people in the pool. Missy Franklin, she may be the one that's the, the, the superstar coming out of the Games. I think the other thing to recognize is that uh, a lot of these women, and men for that matter, um, while they are from other countries, they train in the United States. <laughs> So, so, you know, who, who do you give credit for that? The United States coaches are coaching, you know, probably 65% of the world, if you will. So it's, it's going to be interesting. You know, that's, that's why they run the competitions, right?